Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Anybody got any questions they want to kick in before we jump in? We got a lot of stuff to cover again. Man, every time I get in here, I'm like, oh, I could probably go four hours. <laughs> Anybody got anything they need to ask, clarification, did anything, share any successes that are coming from the class? All right. Okay, then let's get going. You guys ready to rock and roll? Make sure you got, I'm, I'm not muted, right? Give me some thumbs up. Looking at some of you. All right, cool. Let me get my chat going here and we'll get the screen shared. I try to watch the chat, but uh, I know we got some people behind the scenes that definitely are. So you guys are still welcome to jump in at any point that uh, you want to just get in and cut me, cut in there. Even though I get going and I start talking like crazy, I hope, hopefully you guys aren't just uh, stuck in lecture mode that you are really plugged in. I feel like for the most part you are, um, find my share, my screen. Can I find that? Oh, there it is. Um, but yeah, cause I don't want it to be a lecture. I, I mean, I'm throwing in ideas to help like, jar your your ideas loose in your head and you guys can think of ways that you can put this stuff into play all right let me switch my screen here there we go all right so everybody can see the screen okay here we go today we're i mean we're again during through ignite we're talking about growing your business and then we're talking about running your business right uh hold on let me get going here So that's the whole purpose for Ignite. So the spark is the ideas and things that you guys are coming up with. And man, I, I have some great ones for sellers today. I'm actually going to share with you a, a court, just a class presentation thing that I put together on how to find the hidden listings, like the listings that are all right in front of you. So as we look for sellers, obviously we all want more listings and hopefully I'll, I'll kind of give you guys some new ideas or some fresh ideas on where you could actually find listings if you're going to be on purpose, right? So before we even get going, just keep in mind that underlaying factor is connecting with five people a day and connecting meaning you have a meaningful conversation. Like I'm not talking about the ones, it, like if you really truly are doing lead generation, then seriously, kudos, because that's what it is about is finding the next deal so you can get that next one on the books. And even like right now, I do more of the stuff that I usually don't have to do in a normal market because I'm very on purpose about trying to get my listing inventory back up to 30 listings. You know, in a normal market, I used to carry 30, 40 listings. And at one point we would carry 60 listings. And in this market, I mean, when I have three listings and I get excited about three active listings, that's actually kind of scary. And I don't know if some of you are in that same boat, but you know, if we wake up today and we don't have any listings, we're technically out of business. So it is, a, it is about running a little faster and a little more on purpose and listening for every single clue that you can pick up on and really truly taking these ideas that I'm going to give you today because I've done them. This is how I built my business. And I'm just sharing the stuff that I do every single day that I'm on purpose about to get beyond that. So, but today, I mean, we're, we're, we are still talking about lead generating for the buyers and sellers. And today is the sellers. So hopefully you've downloaded uh, spark number eight, which are the ideas. And then we're going to get really detailed in the element section on how to actually run the business with those things. So today's topic is just on understanding motivation. Understanding motivation, qualifying and converting seller leads or, you know, qualifying them and finding them, right? But pre-qualifying the sellers, and a lot of times there's, we can shortcut that because if they're thinking of selling, you, you just go, go for the gusto and get them on the market because they're probably going to make more money than they ever would in any other market. Which, by the way, I'm going to give you this script right now. This is a great script for anybody that's thinking of selling and you want to get them to make a move on it now or make a, a decision to do it sooner when you know that they're, they're 
kind of waiting. And I hear, you know, coaching top agents all the time. It's like, well, I've got, I've got about three or four on the fence. Guys, change your mindset right now as you're listening to this stuff today. We're, there is no fence. You have to get them off the fence now. So you give them the information and the scripts that you're practicing. If you're really doing script practicing outside of this one hour here and you're working on it with somebody in the office, um, I mean, go to your leadership if you don't have anybody in the, in the class here. Remember, look at the names that are in the rooms right now. Write them down. Take a screenshot of the screenshot today. And these are the agents that are showing up for Ignite. Get band together and get like some time just to go have coffee or you're both, if you're both going to go eat lunch, go eat lunch and then just bring your script books with you and just kind of walk through them and see which one do you like and which one have you used and, and really like play off each other. But the thing that um, I wanted to say on scripts that can really get people off the fence is to say right now, you're probably going to get more for your property right now today than you probably will in probably more than ever, but really like even in three to five years, you're going to get more right now in this market than you might get six months from now. You're going to get the same amount in six months or whatever, unless the market changes. So I basically say you're going to sell at the top end of the market for where you are right now. This is the actual script is like in your neighborhood, we are going to sell you for the top price that you can get out of that neighborhood or that area or that type of property right now. So what you do is you sell at the top end of your area. Now I'm taking into consideration if there's some repos or as is and they're selling lower, they're still gonna get more right now out of this area than they've ever been able to get. The trick is then to buy something at the low end of another area. Now that, and again, I'm saying this as a conversation to get them off the fence. We can all argue all day long, well, nothing's at the low end. Well, there are low end properties that come on or there's, um, if you're moving up, we're gonna talk about what they're moving up to when you're finding sellers, that there are places that you can move up to that will, uh, a more expensive property, when it's appreciating, will appreciate at a higher dollar amount than the lower neighborhoods. So if you can sell for top dollar, and then we're just conscious about not paying over top dollar in the next neighborhood, but getting something reasonable. Even if like, for example, my kids, we were, he was a VA buyer. We ended up just buying a dated home because all the fixed up homes were going for 20,000 over asking price. I said, guys, why don't we just go in for one that's got a lot of work to do or updating to do. So they bought a house that has the old kitchen paneling in the family room, uh, partially unfinished basement that had a bar down there, but we didn't have any competition for it. We didn't have to compete. And I think we came in 5,000 under asking price or right at asking price without having to go over asking price. So they just went for the one that nobody was beaten up because those rehabbed ones were all going for multiple offers. Uh, Pre-listing questionnaire uh, and presentation. So there's, there's some stuff that you can download out of the toolkit that has presentations and things. Again, I'm gonna be real cautious here because we're, care we're covering so much information. You guys aren't supposed to master anything in this hour. You're not gonna master anything this week. If you read the manual before, come to session, read the manual again, read your notes and apply those. Then you can figure out like, is it the presentation that is going to be the next thing that if you do that one thing, nail your presentation, it's gonna make everything else easier. Or is it going to be the qualifying because you're going out on listing appointments that you're not qualifying them right and no, they're not listing with you. So what's the next thing that's going to make everything else easier? And that has to just go on your work on my business plan and work it in until you get it down. So you can, you're going to go glance at the presentation. You're going to glance at the qualifying questions. We talked about the the color-coded forms, we're going to be talking about the one that you can download for the sellers today that qualifies them or gets you to ask the right questions. We'll, we'll go over that one too. But like going into command, going into command one day, if you have an hour of working on your business and you're going through Ignite and now your hour of on time shows up, I know it's an hour here and an hour there and an hour there, but this is being on purpose and Ignite is for that 
adrenaline shot into your business to where it's getting you laser focused back on the right activities versus just being busy all day, right? So that on time might be going into command and just going through the smart plans and just see what smart plans look like they're for a seller. Seller conversion, seller new listing, put yourself on the plan so you can experience what it is. So write that down, like go into command, find a plan and put myself on it and just see how it rolls out and experience it, right? Because then you'll know how to tweak it and make it better. Uh, okay, so again, this is the other thing, you know, talking about this uh, do not call list. I just wanted to say, if it's important that we cover this because there are laws and there's big fines for calling people. However, we're on session eight now. So I don't know if you've made it to all the sessions or if you just made it to a couple, one of the underlying conversations that will make this not as scary to you. If you're, if you're really paying attention to the do not call list, you're most likely living in that outer ring of calling haven't mets because you're calling FISBOs and expireds and they're mean. They're mean to real estate agents, right? They just had a bad experience with their realtor, didn't sell their house or they're for sale by owner because they didn't like realtors and they don't see the value in them, right? But, and then just calling strangers, yes, you got to abide by the do not call list. But when you work your database, you feed in five a day and you're writing five notes a day. What I'm telling you for certain is that in six months to a year, the do not call list isn't as important because they're all people you're connected with. These people do not ask to be removed from your mailing list. So just keep that in mind with the do not call list. Um, you want your phone to ring back to you when they're ready to sell, like we're talking about sellers today. So when they finally decide, you know, I think we might just see what our house is worth. Just seeing what your house is worth is a, a seller. It's going to be a seller. The, the seed has been planted. I'm, I'm one of those guys that I go on every listing appointment. I, I don't care if they tell me we're really not doing anything now. I mean, we can't do anything until my husband retires and that's in six months or whatever, because I know if I get in the door and sit down at the table and go through my consultation with them, which is a presentation, but I call it more of a consultation because I have a conversation with them, right? That I've already got in, now I'm connected. Now they're on my drip plan. Now they're going to be top They're I'm going to be top of mind for them when they do get ready to sell. So I will go 50% of the listing appointments I go on, they're not close to selling, but I'm getting my foot in the door before anybody else does. So I can make sure we're even connected beyond just like a good connection on the phone call. Right. And a lot of that does come from lead generation. It's, they're still a stranger. We're not really super connected. They're just wondering what their house is worth. I'm getting over there because I can cross over that line. And that, that appointment might only be 30 minutes. I'm just going for the connection, what's important about the move, you know, all that stuff so I can connect, so I can write the notes, so I can add them to the database and, and that's a great way to do it. So I will go on those listing appointments all day long. I know that there's other agents out there that they strongly qualify on the front end and unless they have started the process to sell, they don't go meet them. Well, if I'm the other agent they call, I'm going to get that listing. I'm going to take it away from them. So, you know, it's all in your style and how you do that. I don't know if anybody has any specific questions around that. All right. So let me just kind of, I want you guys to open up your mics a minute. I want to, I want to hear where you guys are looking for and finding sellers right now. Just think about the last <laughs> listing or two that you may have taken. Where are you finding sellers? Fizbos off of Zillow. Fizbos and Zillow. So you got Zillow leads coming in and they're wanting to know value or are they buyer leads and you're talking to them about if they have a house to sell? No, I'm identifying Fizbos that have been on the market. I'm just going like every day when I'm doing the Fizbos, I just open up Zillow for houses for sale by owner and I, and I call number one, number two, number three, number four, number five, number six. How can I help you? You know, uh, uh, yeah, you, you, good for you. You're trying to sell it on your own. You could probably can. But if you don't, I'd like to, you know, get the chance to interview for the job. By the way, can I come over and preview? I might have a buyer that matches. Yeah. So, so how well is that working? Out of six sellers, how many of them do you go preview? Oh, if I, if out of six, 
maybe out of 12, I'll get one, one or two at a, at a, if, at a 10, I'll get one or two. Um, okay. I'm, I'm taking offers on a house that I got from FISBO like a month ago, July 4th, July 3rd, I signed them and I'm getting offers. I, I just got an offer yesterday. Awesome. Um, yeah. So you, you help the for sale by owner find a property. So they put their house, they got a contract on it with you. No, I, I went to the guy you and sold I said, theirs. I sold theirs. Yeah. And, and it, it happens. This one is an estate sale, so he's not going anywhere. But he's been he was living in the neighborhood for 40 years. And he knows, oh, that's the Kasui's house. And oh, that's the, the Alsop's house. And so I've been, you know, yeah. I'm getting close to him. And I'm like, introduce me to these guys. Let's go. You know, they're they're spread me around. Give me some referrals. So not, not to put you on the spot, but to put you on the spot. Um, if, I mean, do you do this pretty much every day? Are you pretty? I, I do. I do the FISBOs on Mondays and Tuesdays. Okay. Just because so you know, they're coming off has the Has it changed? Has, has it changed? Your conversations changed with anything on that connection part where those other eight out of 10, are you getting them in the database on a better follow-up since you've been going through this class? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I still get the, the usual, you know, don't bother call me, bring a buyer, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But I've been, I've been, you know, I definitely have the address. I've got the phone number and I, I say, can I send you information? You know, it's, it's not so easy for sale by owner. There's a lot of details that, you know, I could help you out with and COVID, I'll send them a COVID um, uh, sheet, you know, sign out sheet and things like that. So they can, and a copy of the contract, you know, just to give them a token. All right. So guys, listen up, everybody listen up, whether or not you're doing FISBOs or not, which, you know, I already know most people don't do it regimentally like Scott probably is. Uh -huh. Let me just add something. I want you guys all to hear this. So Scott, on those, if you'll not necessarily even ask if you can send them information, just try this. Drop a note in the mail. No, everybody listen, everybody you talk to, even if it's like you're not that super connected or they're like just kind of short and quick, but you have their address, you know, their phone number, right? Mm -hmm. Try this one step, write a note to whoever it is, internet lead, whatever. If you have their address, write the note, no, I, me or my. And Scott, if you try this, just say it was great connecting on the phone. Um, congratulations on, or, or, Good luck with, you know, your marketing and, and hope to hope to see you sell your property. No, I, me or my in it. Right. And if at any time uh, you would like to have the property viewed to see if there's any other buyers in the marketplace that you might be missing, let me know something like that. Just or mm -hmm. even just recap is thank you for taking your time out today to chat about your property for a little bit. Um, best of luck to you, Scott. Try sending that note first and then add in another phone call in three days just to quickly follow up. Even though it was short, just call again and say, hey, just checking to see if there's anything I can assist you with. I know we just talked a few days ago and watch what happens. They'll, they'll say, oh my gosh, I got your note yesterday. Yes, yeah, thank you. All of a sudden, they're, they're like a totally different person. It's like this barrier breaker. So try yeah. that and let me know how it works out, okay? Yeah. Yep. Don't even ask for permission because that's not a connection. There are times when you're going to do that. But I'm telling you, if you switch that around and you have their information anyway, just drop that non-branded, no I, me or my, no business card, no PS. It's just uh, it's great hearing about your home, um, whatever it might be. You know, that neighborhood's a great neighborhood. Best of luck to you, whatever. Something and just, along those and just sign it and not say, call me if you get a chance or anything. Just but, sign it. And just sign it. Put them in your database and put them on a on on a smart plan or a drip plan so that something goes out like the resume would go out on my drip plan one week behind that note card. Right. Uh -huh. So there's I don't have to have my card in there. I don't have to have this card branded. It throws them off. It, it, it's that limbic part of the brain that they already had that on when you were on the phone. It's like huh, another realtor, another salesperson. So no matter what you say, they're not even processing what you're saying because that's just another realtor who wants to try and get my listing. So they're not even paying attention. The note comes in and they're like, well, that was okay. This guy's different than everybody else. Doesn't even have his business card. It's, it's, a, it's a barrier breaker. You get past that limbic part of the brain. Wow. And then the next time you call, what it does is the note gets them to take your call next time. 
Mm. Like right now, the current process is I bet you don't get them back on the phone a second time very often. Because now they got your phone. You, you always say or have clients say all the time, I think I'm blocked. Why don't you try and call him? Really? I mean, I never have blocked anybody on my phone ever. So I don't know why we always think they're blocking us. Because do you guys do it? Do you block people from your phone? No. I can't remember the last time I blocked anybody from my phone. So again, it's our, it's our self-talk going on there. Okay. All right. So I'm finding seller leads. Let me make sure. I, yeah. Okay. So it's got a little process here. I mean, when well, you've got your database, your 10-4 during Ignite is to get those 10 people in four days. I think it's four days a week. <laughs> I should know that. But open houses, referrals. Okay. Here's what I want to say about this. Finding these seller leads. Remember that on your buyer leads, because we're getting, a, it, it's harder to get sellers off the internet than it is buyers and buyers are filling out and searching for homes. Well, what I know statistically from NAR is over 70%, I think it's like 73% or 77% of all buyers have owned their home, have a home to sell. So just keep in mind that three out of four buyers looking to buy real estate, probably have a home to sell, according to NAR. So this was interesting because on my team, I kept hearing this number and I'm trying to validate the number. And I was talking, you know, I've got a team of four buyer's agents at this time when I'm listening to this number and I just started tracking it. And I said, here's the deal, guys, we're my buyer's agents. If 70% of them own a home, none of, like we had 400 leads come through last month. We got probably 10 or 15 of them into the database between all four of them, right? But I didn't get 10 listing appointments or eight listing appointments from those buyers. So I came up with a deal for my team. I said, if you get a buyer lead and you get them converted into the blue sheet, right? I want you to ask if they own their property. And if you turn me in a yellow sheet for that buyer that we got you, you will get all the leads off of this property when we get the listing and go to market it. So these were my buyer's agents. So let me say that again. All, I made it an incentive that there wouldn't be a round robin of the leads that came off our marketing from this listing, which our listings generated buyer leads, more, more leads, right? So that would be tagged just under you. You're, if you get the listing yellow sheet filled out, they don't do listings on my team but they did buyers, you would get all the leads that came in off of that listing. They would go directly to you. Now that was a little bit of an organization on the, the office side, but I'm telling you what, the one agent that got it, he was turning in probably two of those for every four or five buyers. It just, now all of a sudden I was getting listing appointments because he saw the incentive and he just asked the question. It wasn't even the incentive. It was just like, nobody thinks about it. So every buyer that you're talking to, if you can add to your script, do you have a house? Do you own your property that you're in now? Right. And so internet leads, I know there's a lot of people looking for rentals, so you're not going to get as many of that, but you will find that about a real buyers, a third of them have a house to sell. Here's your find your hidden listings. So if you're looking for different places to find listings, you guys have to write these down. It's not in your book. And this is where I wanted to kind of give you some really, really good ideas. All right. So expired listings, not just expired listings. I'm talking about expired listings from two to three years ago. Expired listings from two to three years ago. In fact, if you even go back to expired listings in 2010 and 2011, that was during the crash and right before things turned around. If they were upside down in five and six and or, and or the short sales disappeared and people bought short sales too. But in 2010 or 11, we came out of that crash in about 15, 16, 17. So really 10, 11, 12, 13, any of those years, pull up expireds in your MLS in whatever and target the area or the price range you want, really want to be in because you're going to have thousands of them. So if you want to be in a a million to a million five, pull up those years on a million, million five in the area that's right around where you live. So you don't have to be in traffic all that much. Start really tight. And if you get a hundred expireds from four or five years ago, 
they are pro and they and you go through the history and they have not resold. So once we pull that list up, I just click on it, hit history. If they've resold, they resold since then, since 11, 12 or 13, whatever I pulled up, then I just take them off the list. But I go through and I hit the history button and I can quickly pull out five or six sellers that are still in the properties, still has their name on the tax record and it hasn't exchanged hands, right? So then you can use fast people search or whatever to go find your phone number. So expired from a few years ago. Another one, here's a great one. Now this, this is a, a two-step process, but solds. How often did we say the average person moves? what did you guys determine? 10 years, right? 10 years. Solds in the area you want to dominate from 10 years ago. Actually, you probably got from seven to 12 years ago, right? Solds in that immediate area back then. Again, once you get the list of the solds, click on the history, click on each listing individually, click on the history to see if it's exchanged hands since then. So we missed that one. But a lot of those people are just now starting to think about moving again. That is the hottest list on the planet. How many of you thumbs up if you're like, holy crud, that is amazing right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Five, 10, they're moving. They're already moving, right? So then the goal is gonna be to find their missing information, get connected with them so you can write the note and then put them on a smart plan or a drip plan to start building that relationship. You don't even have to bug them. You don't have to call them and go, hey, you bought your house 10 years ago. The average person moves every 10 years. I'm here to help you sell your house today. 98% of them are not moving right now, but they are already thinking about it. And so you got to get into relationship with them so that you're the first person they think of and they call you back, right? That's a whole different thing with, with the do not call list. If I'm not calling and bugging them with a sales script, I'm just calling to check in. How have you liked the neighborhood? You know, things been doing good. And again, starting the conversation, I would say, hey, you don't know me from Adam. We haven't met yet. However, I am a top real estate agent in your neighborhood, and I was just checking in on people in the neighborhood. That's a hot area. We've got buyers calling all the time, but I was just calling to see, you know, if you guys like your home, are you guys going to stay there for a while? Pretty soon, they just like, oh, okay. They feel safe, and they start opening up. So how long have you been there? Oh, kids, are, they'll tell you about your kids. I mean, they tell me their life story, and that's why I've got that note section, because they just start talking, and I'm just writing down everything I can think of. Or, or that they're saying that, that I need to remember the uncle lived in, kids went to college, all that kind of stuff, just taking notes. And I don't care if I get the listing appointment or not, I'm going to get the listing and I'm going to get the listing appointment when they're ready to sell. So it's building that relationship. Here's another way that you could do that is if it's a, and I don't know if you guys have specific neighborhoods necessarily. I mean, are they like targeted group neighborhoods where it's uh, the streets, you go through the entrance and you have the streets through there. I'm seeing Scott nod, yes. Some, some, some neighbor, huh? some. Yeah, and you might have condo buildings or something like that that's part of a condo that you work all the time, whatever it might be. So I'm gonna describe it this way and you guys put it into perspective on whatever you're working. If there's a neighborhood that I wanted to target and I'm pulling up sales from 10 years ago and that's my list I'm working off of, what I would actually do is print off a Google map of the neighborhood. So you have the streets that are going through the neighborhood. You can see all the little houses, right? It's just a Google map. Start at the entrance and like, like you're sitting in the doctor's office and you're doing a little crossword puzzle or the maze thing, just waiting for your turn to go to the doctor. Do the same thing. If I were at the entrance, I would come in and I'd walk around this side of the street. I'd go down in this cul-de-sac. I'd come back out. I'd go up here and I'd go all the way around till I get back. Then I'd cross over the street and go back the other side, right? Draw an arrow through the neighborhood until you've gotten from the entrance past every single door back out to the entrance, right? Think about this for a minute. Blow that map up big. Um, I don't know if I can see it over here. My, my thing's a little, uh, let's see. No, it's on the other side of that. That right there is a map of the lake community that I live in. It's blown up huge on the wall and it's got the, the, lot, the lot boxes and I'm just putting all the owner's names in there because there's an underground world in this lake community that a lot of houses don't hit the market. 
So I'm just, every time I meet somebody, I'm adding them on the box so I can know where the Stefans live and, and where the Osters live. And I'm just like making it aware. Plus they're in my database. Whenever I meet them, they're in my database. There's a picture of them with the contact record. I got all their information. So I'm seeing that all the time too. And I've just got them on a normal drip plan, you know, the eight by eight and the 33 touch. I should probably mute that out. It would probably annoy me more than it will you guys. All right. So, um, so as you go through today, you're going to do your door knocking or your marketing or whatever, and go meet some sellers in that neighborhood. Start at the entrance and knock on doors until five people answer. So when I'm going down the street, I get down four doors. No, nobody, 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 nobody. This person answers. Put an X on that house. You're done with that one. You've met them. Hi, you're just introducing yourself. Uh, sell a lot of homes in the neighborhood. Just want to introduce myself. I know you're probably not selling or anything. Oh, no, we're not moving anywhere. No, no, no. I'm just introducing myself in case you have friends that want to move into the neighborhood. I sell a lot in here or you're going to sell a lot, whatever. Your normal conversation, the red wagon script from Bold, if you remember that, it's, it's a, I'm just here to find out what you like about the neighborhood. I, I love this neighborhood. I sell homes in this neighborhood. I have buyers for this neighborhood. So I like to just talk to the homeowners and find out what they love about the neighborhood. What do you love about your house? What do you love about this? Great. Thank you so much for sharing that. It's nice to meet you. Going to get a handwritten note going on the eight by eight. It's not about real estate, right? Do that until you get five doors. Once you get five X's, you're done for the day. If the first five doors open, you get the end early, right? Go back tomorrow, do it again, skip the X's. Just keep knocking on doors again from the entrance all the way through until you get your five X's, until you get your next five, until you get your next five. If there are 500 homes and you did it every day, five days a week, it will take you five months to meet every single owner in the neighborhood. Every single owner in the neighborhood saw your face, got a handwritten note. Guys, you can dominate a neighborhood that way. How many of you like that idea a little bit? Yeah, all right. Um, I've never, in my coaching career, I've never had anybody take the challenge and do it. So this is you, right? Let me know how it works. Um, so that's a 100% success rate in a neighborhood where most people talk about getting 20% market share. You can have 100% market share. People get 20% market share of a neighborhood by marketing to it for 20 years, right? So you can say you have 20% market share after 20 years because you're getting about 1% a year by mass marketing. Do the per Bring the personalization into it. And then you can do like all the neighborhood kind of stuff like the dumpster days or, you know, the pumpkins or the flags or any of that kind of stuff. That stuff goes a lot further when you've actually got personal connections with everybody. They actually... Pull, pull it in. Uh, see if there's anything else. Oh, this is a great one. Leads that are sitting on your desk that you never got. That is probably hundreds of people that however long you've been in, there's a list of people that never listed that you that you talk to about possibly buying or selling. Go back through your entire list of buyers, right? Every lead you've ever gotten on buyers go back through the whole list, get them on the phone and ask them, you know, if they've moved since then. You can also search their name on tax records and some other things, but you can just pick up the phone and call and just say, hey, I was just checking in. We met like two years ago and you were on the internet looking for a house. I just wondered if you guys ever moved. Oh, really? Great. Whatever it is. Now I know they either own a house and I missed the listing, but now they're in my database. So I'll get a handwritten note. And I mean, this is how you can lead generate more fun stuff than just talking to strangers right so are you I, yeah i've done that um i've done that i went back through all my open house sign-in sheets and i identified two two buyers that haven't bought and this was maybe going back three years ago and they're now actively looking to buy so that does work yeah michelle it totally works and because remember only one percent of them were moving then anyway but there's another one or two percent moving today there's, you know, 10% moving over the next three or four or five or 10 months, right? So everybody's still moving, but if they're moving every five to 10 years, there's more of them have not moved than have moved. So thank you for sharing that. Guys, it, that is killer. Just going through your old leads, right? And now you get to ask that script of, 
hey, I was just curious. I heard that, you know, when people start looking for a home, they usually own a home. Do you own your home? You know, however you got to do it, right? But you just get into conversation. So open house is the other one that's obvious. I mean, there's a checklist, a countdown checklist um, on the toolbox. Guys, this is actually a campaign that's in my database, a smart plan that you pull up your seller's name and start the open house plan. And all of this stuff is triggered in a smart plan when you create it on the things that you do a week before the open house. So I would go into the smart plan. If the open house is, you know, two weeks from now, then my plan starts the week before the open house. We do this. We put signs up on every corner, blah, blah, blah. If we can do that, whatever it might be, just go through the list, pull your stuff out. Like the day of on my to-do list, it says, pull up three price ranges of homes for my open house. So I've got a home, let's just say I got a listing at 500,000. So I'm going to pull up like probably 400 to 600 will be the listings around my $500,000 listing. But then I'll also pull up 200 to 400, a one line list. And I'll pull up 600 to a million one line list. That way, if the buyers come in and go, oh, this one was a little more than we were thinking. It's like, okay, well, I got a list of 37 houses in the 200 to $400,000 range. Uh, what are you guys looking for? And then you just start writing down their information of what they're looking for. So, and then because we're talking about sellers, you say, and now do you guys own your home as well? Just that one line, you guys own a home as well that you got to sell. And you're going to either find out they own it, they don't have to sell it, whatever it might be. But what should be three out of four buyers will say, yeah, we own a home. Um, okay. Anybody else? Good, good stuff. Qualifying them, connecting questions. Guys, when you're connecting with people, I mean, just remember Ford, family, occupation, recreation, dreams. I mean, that is just easy. And bold scripts too. It's really important if you can work in there, that one of, here, here's just one if they're not moving. Actually, I'll go through these first and I'll share the bold script that, that I would use. So if you would, please tell me a little bit about your family, your job. Well, that's Ford. Okay. What are you looking for? What do you want to do? Where would you like to buy? Where's the, the, where is your home located? Why are you moving? So these, the way I ask this question is sometimes we already know 98% of the people aren't necessarily buying. So you might be asking these questions and only somebody who's really buying knows what area they're looking in. Open houses, they may just be starting the process. The reason why it's still only around one to two to 3%, even if you're doing an open house, is because everybody's coming in at different stages. What I will tell you about internet buyer leads, if you can get them on the phone, remember we were talking, I think it was either the last session or session before, you have about three seconds to return their call and get them on the phone. The reason why you're moving that fast and being that on purpose is so you don't have to talk to strangers all the time. You're actually talking to somebody who is thinking about buying or selling. But the reason why the internet is such a low conversion rate is because people are, are secretly checking things out. Their spouse doesn't even know they're really looking yet. Uh, the spouse, by the way, was be like, what? We're not selling. You know, you're calling somebody back and you're like, hey, you were on our website looking for homes. Like, we ain't selling. The wife was looking. The husband was not, right? So whatever that might be. But the reason what I say about internet buyers, what I figured out is they are three to four months from being an active buyer when they start on the internet. So the, the faster, if you got three seconds and you get them on the phone, what you're doing with everything we're talking about on the branding and the follow-up and the campaigns is you're taking them off the market so nobody else can have them. It doesn't mean that they're not going to go visit some more websites and get the random calls, but now they're going to be easily saying after they get the handwritten note, we already got an agent that we call if we have questions, because that's part of our follow-up and our relationship building is one of the scripts I say is, I'm going to text you my personal cell phone number. I want you to save it in your contact records under Brad Corn Realtor. And that is your number. You can text me any address, any property. I don't even care if it's for sale or not. Text me the information you would like to find out more about a property. That's what I do every day. I can pull that stuff up and let you know what's going on with it. So I have people calling me all the time. I'm for sale by owners. I mean, and all they're doing, all I'm doing is shortcutting the process and getting plugged in 
to help them with information, but now I know they're moving through the process and they're, they're not a one percenter or whatever it might be. Does that make sense? So that, that bold script is if 98% of them aren't moving, here's another way to use the bold script of, so, you know, what's important about that date? What happens if you don't hit that date? You know, all that. Think of it this way and say, well, let me ask you this. So if they say they're not really moving right now, we're just kind of starting the process. Okay, so uh, I like the way Tony DeSello would ask, if you did know the answer to this next question, what would it be? That was kind of how Tony would always ask it. So I just, I twisted that in and I say, so if you could move now, where would you move to? Where are your ideal locations? What's important about that to you? Now I'm back into the bold script of, you know, if they say, well, if I could move now, I'd move to Florida. Really? Why Florida? Why'd you choose that? Well, my grandkids are close there, but oh, cool. So if you were close to your grandkids, what would that do, you know, for you? And it's like, oh man, my grandkids are awesome. I mean, we hope to get there someday. Okay, cool. Well, um, whenever that time comes up, uh, this is what I do full time. I'll be available. But now I just learned a whole lot, right? So now I'm calling a Florida realtor and I'm, you know, I may have even found out a little more information or I'll find it out on the next call, whatever it might be, but I'm being very on purpose just to find out. Now, if I just didn't ask that question and I'm just randomly waiting for the Florida conversation to start, it might not happen for five years. It might not happen for seven years, who knows? But what I did was I just planted the seed. Now they're thinking about Florida, which means I'm gonna get a listing pretty soon, a lot sooner by asking that question than not asking the question. Good stuff. So remember the other thing when you're doing your, uh, your conversations with sellers and, and you're qualifying and converting, when you're sitting down and doing a listing presentation or consultation, there's a million things like all the slides and everything that you can go through that you do to market your property. And if you're just kind of sitting there telling all the things that you're going to do and talking, 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 and they're not talking, that's not a consultation. So one of the best things I ever did was remember we talked about value proposition. If you guys have not gone back and reviewed the value proposition call, which I think was about two or three calls ago, it was either four or five, I think, um, go back to that. Because once I just started talking about the three things that my competitors can't say or won't say, and I made that the beginning conversations of my consultation, and then I let the seller guide me at that point where we're going with it, how soon they want to sell and where that conversation is going. But like my value proposition was telling people that MLS does not sell properties, okay? ML, I'm, I'm discounting the MLS because every agent that's going before me is talking about how we're going to have you an MLS. And I always, and I come in and I say, MLS doesn't sell properties. There's a, there's a hundred, 200 properties that would pop up if I did a search today and you're just buried in the list. It's kind of like your last realtor.com or Zillow search. It was, you were scrolling through screens. You were skipping over pictures without, or, or stuff without pictures or missing information or whatever it might be. It's the same thing with MLS. An agent might print off a stack of MLS sheets and see, I do this. You know, our MLS sheet stacks aren't this big right now. It's like uh, two pieces of paper. But you say MLS sheets just printing off a stack of properties and handing that to their buyer to sift through. We're going to get you singled out because we don't rely on the MLS to sell your property. We drive the agents to the listing in MLS to pull your property up and look at it. Now, you may ask, how do you do that? You market to the agents that are marketing in that neighborhood. I can pull up sales in MLS of every agent that sold anything in that neighborhood or that community. And I could even see who sold the most. So if somebody really sold five properties in that neighborhood in the last two years, that agent's going to get a, a notice from me directly on the property. I might even pick up the phone and call and say, hey, I got a new listing over in the neighborhood. I, I know you sell a lot over there. So that's direct marketing, but that's something nobody else does. That's a value proposition, right? Another one I always say, you can't really interview for reputation. So I have a great reputation with the agents. They like working with me because I share my marketing stuff. I mean, I could do this class with every competitor in town and they'll come, they'll be like, they'll have the same experience. Hopefully you guys are having and they won't do anything with it because they're not plugged into something where they're repeating it and going through it again, or they're not in, they're not in a culture 
of training at, at my competitor's office. I give them my marketing brochures and say, yeah, I put these in every listing and all that other stuff. And they don't really ever do anything with it. But because I share it, they, they like Brad shares all of his marketing. We like we like Brad. All my competitors like me. And that's because 90 percent of all the listings I sell is going to be through one of my competitors, not me. Right. It's going to be through another agent. So I just make sure my my community awareness with the agents is good. So I use that against them. You know, there's some pretty much I hear stories about all the other top agents in the area and they're just jerks to people. Well, that doesn't help their client at all. If the agents think you're a jerk, then they're they write lower offers or they don't even show their properties. So you got to be real careful who you hire to market your property based on their reputation. Uh, the other one that's really, really big, and then we'll kind of move on, but I really want, is it good that I'm spending some time on this? You guys getting some good stuff? Yeah. So guys, use KW. This, I say this at everything, and this is a serious value proposition. I say we get you to over 350 websites, right? In fact, tell, you could even play on that and go, Keller Williams it may look like a real estate company, but really we're a technology company and we're a training company. That's what makes us different from the other people. So our technology gets you to 350 websites. And the reason why I say that is because most agents who just put the property in MLS, it might automatically get fed out to maybe a hundred websites. So we're getting you about three times, three and a half times the exposure by being a tech company that's connected with a lot more portals versus just putting it in MLS halfway filled out because I've already showed them, you know, the blanks in several listings. If their old listing was on there, I don't ever print off the copy that shows the agent's name on there but I'll print off a client copy of either a neighborhood, a house in the neighborhood or in the immediate area that doesn't have pictures, that's missing MLS information. And when I'm sitting down with them and I say, MLS doesn't sell properties, right? I pull out that sheet and I start circling all the things that were left blank. And that's where I talk about, I fill in every single blank. So you come up higher on the searches. Every, you never know how people are searching, even on the internet sites. All these blanks right here just mean if anybody put in one thing in that field, it, you're, you're invisible. So you have to be careful who you hire. Guys, that's a huge script right there, right? If they did, if they put 40 photos in, I put 99 photos in. I know you're not going to look at 99 photos. See, I already, that's a little change because most people are just like, oh, I would never look at 99 photos, which means they're discounting my value proposition and I didn't explain it properly. Because the 99 photos, even though I know you're probably going to look at 20 or 30, I even duplicate the, the last half of the pictures with the front half because then it never looks like you're really doing it. It just looks like you went through the, the carousel, right? But by putting 99 photos, you could be a 98% match with a buyer's search. Your competition, the house that's competing for your buyer could be a 99% match. But with our marketing, you're going to come up ahead of them on the list because we filled in 99 photos and filled in every blank. They chose an agent that didn't use all the photos, didn't know the importance of technology and only got them to 100 websites and they didn't fill everything in. So you guys see how that rolls when I'm when I'm in a consultation with the seller. I'm still explaining things, but I'm explaining that value proposition. So use the 350 website. All right. Let's see here. So seller lead categories, we already talked about the A, the B, and the C buyers. It's the same thing on your sellers, A, B, and C um, sellers as well. But what I want to make sure you get from this is because you would ask like on a C buyer, they're not really buying right. If you get an A buyer and they say, yeah, we're thinking about selling, we would like to know what our house is worth. I probably don't have to give you a whole lot of scripts there. It's like get the appointment booked and go. But those A buyers still need to go. And I should say, and I mean, because we're bold and you need to put them on a drip plan. So I have a, a call. What is it? A call every two weeks. This would be for a B, B seller. A B seller will go on a call every two weeks until they list. So there's a, they're still on the eight by eight and the 33 touch, but I'm going to make sure I call them every two weeks for a B seller. If they're an A seller, 
I'm just going to have them on the 8x8 eight eight or the 33 touch, um, maybe a little more aggressive. I think you could actually have a plan. I don't have one. I just use the default one. But you could have a plan that's how to get your house ready, staging. These are AA sellers that are getting ready. I don't use that plan a whole lot because if they're an AA seller, I'm usually got the appointment booked and I'm going to see it in the next day or two. So that's the only reason I don't have that plan there is I'm booking the appointment. There's no fence sitting. There's no time to sit on the fence. It's like, I will downplay it and just say, you know, why don't you just, before you do anything, just have me come by and I'll tell you if it's even important, if it will make your house sell faster, if it'll make you more money. And please, please, please do not spend any money until you talk to me because I may advise you not to do it. And you get there a lot of times they're wanting to do and fix things that really are not important, especially when there's no other houses on the market, right? But this is the point I want to get, the C sellers. See, when you operate in bulk and you have A, B, and C, the C sellers that aren't really in, like moving right this minute, but they have thought about possibly moving. So these are sellers who have thought about it and we might be move, we, we might move next spring, whatever. How do you keep in touch with them, guys? I mean, these are the stacks of paper that Michelle was just talking about that are on our desk and they were C's and we forgot about them. They just got buried underneath a pile. Put them on a drip plan that keeps popping them up so you can stay in front of them. You're branding yourself. You got four phone calls a year on the 36 touch, right? Four social media touches or text messages a year. That's eight touches throughout the year so that when they do move up to a B or an A, you're starting to get the call back from them. They, it makes your phone ring, not you make their phone ring, right? So I have something to that point because some, some of the people on the call on this class may have heard this this morning, um, but I, um, I was referred to someone, my friend, and only had an email address. So I put this woman on a, a monthly uh, nurture in command and followed up with her occasionally with sent her just email updates, like what's happening at the townhouse development. So what's happening in her development, maybe quarterly. She was, she, she reached out last week and said she's ready to talk to a realtor. I met her on Saturday and signed the listing. But my point being is that I, I didn't have a phone number. She wasn't living in the unit. So I don't know where she lived. I didn't have her address. Um, so yes, follow up and putting, putting on a drip, even if you only have an email address and touching base quarterly is it works. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's, and it's scheduling the call. So even though you have a smart plan running, so she's got the email smart plan running, make sure you're adding another plan. You can run two plans, right? Run another plan that's calls every two weeks or every quarter or every, whatever you think that is. Um, I'm going on a listing appointment here this afternoon that she came into my system December of 2020. And she is on uh, a drip plan. Oh, I'm logged out of my database at the moment. Um, she came in in December of 2020. I've watched letters go out. Um, I've sent her whenever it said to do, send a market update. So that shows her what's selling in the neighborhood. Um, I've just been like, I've never really connected with her on the phone other than right maybe at the very beginning. And I remember her saying, ah, I'm not sure. You know, she said she was kind of a C seller. But really from, well, I guess December of 2020, she kind of was a C seller because it's now what, eight months later. And that call just popped up and I just left voicemails and hey, nothing urgent, Fran, just uh, checking in, see if you have any questions. And that was it, took me two seconds. And I only did it when my smart plan told me to. Listing appointment today, it's uh, on acreage and it's probably gonna be in the 300, $400,000 range. So that little follow-up that I don't even remember doing all the little touches is gonna make me about 12 grand right? $12,000. So thank you for sharing that. It is important to do the phone calls and have, you, it's important to get them on the drip plan is the point I hope you're hearing so that you don't forget about them, right? Once they're, and everybody in the database should be on a drip plan, on a smart plan of some sort with phone calls built into it and or personal reminders to go like pull up their name, look at their picture, do something that's not automated. Like, pull up their sales in their neighborhood for the last year. Or there could be a calendar, the, the, let's just say like for Blue Springs as a community they, where they shut down Main Street and they have all the booths and all that stuff. If that person pops up as a to-do and they're in Blue Springs, 
the message might be like, hey, are you going to Fall Down Fest? Fall, they call it Fall Fun Fest, but we call it Fall Down Fest because we have a lot of fun. <laughs> so we call it going to Fall Down Fest, you know, and they might say, oh, yeah, we're going to go by, yeah, blah, blah, whatever, you know. So it just gets you, com- gets you the personal touch back in there, right? So that helps remind you of that. Okay. Great share. Great shares. All right, so this is where you kind of re- role play or whatever some of the steps. You guys are t- bringing a lot of this stuff to you, but this asking for appointment, asking referral. Again, we got the one hour condensed version that I want to, I really want to get you excited about this seller thing and the things that we're talking about that you're like, okay, I got to get these scripts. But if I get you doing the calls, get you doing the connections and the seller appointments start coming, then you're going to find out like, oh, I need to know a script. And if you've got, if you're writing down the things that you don't know what to answer or say, then it gets you on purpose to go find the script that you're actually going to use versus us just being in a four hour class and going through scripts that you may or may not use. So use your, use that little notebook to write down what I call the objections that you get for not getting the appointment or not. Whenever the outcome doesn't happen the way you want, write down the last thing they said and go find a script that you could have used. Go, go find three scripts that you could have used. Even though you don't have that opportunity again, you're going to have that opportunity to show up again. And that's how I mastered scripts. And I found the scripts that I would actually use. And then I was tracking the results and I'd tweak a word here or there. And then they started working and that's how I mastered scripts. But on this, what I will tell you is that it's important about finding their motivation. Like what, when I said, If you could move, you know, where would you go? Like if money were no object and your job didn't have anything to do it, oh, I'd move to Ireland. Really? Why Ireland? It's just getting the conversation started, right? But I'm going to tell you guys right now that if you master the why conversation, master the big why, the big why, what is their big why? If they were to move, What's important to them about that? What is, what's the thing that would drive them towards that? When you start mastering the asking big why questions. Now I did send an email out and I believe it's on the, on the drive, the Google share drive or whatever drive we have. There's two things that I wrote up on your big why. And they're really good questions where you ask about two or three layers down. So it's like, you want to move to Ireland. Really? Why'd you pick Ireland? Well, blah, 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 blah. Okay, cool. And so, you know, your, your relatives were from there. So if you were living where your relatives were there, there, what would that do for you? Right. And then it'd be like, oh, I learned my history. I'd love to be a part of that community. Great. So if you're a part of that community, what would that do? Oh, I'd enjoy life again. So now you just drill down to what the big why is, which means that they're probably not enjoying life at their current house. Right. And that, so like my big thing I've used during COVID, is okay so we've been through the first round of COVID this could be your guys's conversation now it's like hey as this second round of COVID starts are you still in the house that you did not enjoy being locked up in or when you were locked up during the first round if this were to happen again did you notice all the things that were wrong with your house and all the things you had to fix and all that you know now might be the time to go ahead and make that move, get into a house you could love, a neighborhood that you love, so that if another lockdown like this would ever happen, you love being home. Like I, I can personally say I love being in my house. I could be in this room all day, every day. In fact, I had to do it for 10 days once last December. You know what I mean? So I love this house. And this is where I would want, I mean, if I was in my other house before we moved right before COVID hit, if we were in that other house, it would be miserable. That neighborhood was horrible. We didn't know our neighbors. It was uh, awful. So master the why. And then as far as pre-qualifying sellers, so in your book, remember that 98% of the people are not moving, right? They're not moving. So when you're having these conversations, you might have to talk future tense into what they might be doing. But the 1% that are moving, find out their motivation. Why is that date important to you? Book the appointments and just downplay it. Say, hey, let's just get together. I'm going to show you what the market's been doing, what things are selling for. And we'll come up with a game plan for whatever that option may be. And I usually tell people, I'm going to give you probably three or four different scenarios 
of what's available and we can figure out which one matches what you guys want to do because they can they can get rid of the house and sell it dirt cheap and be done with it or they can fix it up and make money so i just drove by a house yesterday and i went through the house and i said all right there's several options here so i need to find out for sure what do you guys want to do the husband's like totally hands off just dump the dang thing the wife is like, well, I don't want to give it away. So if there's some things we could do to make a little more money, right? So 60, this is Kansas City, $60,000 as is with all the crap in the house, just they can probably get 50 to 60,000. If they were to rent a dumpster for $400 and pay some kid four or $500 just to take everything completely out of the house and just kind of not really, really clean it, clean it up, but just empty it out and make sure it's not shrapnel laying around they're probably going to get 60 to 70,000. So you might make 5 to 10,000 dollars more by spending a little bit of time or a little bit of money, that'd probably be a pretty good investment. Otherwise they're going to beat them up, right? Now if you want to go in and really put in new carpet and paint and make it move in ready, I mean the kitchen's already done, it's nice stainless steel appliances, you might get 90,000. So is it going to be worth 70 to 90, 20,000 to maybe put 5 or 10 into it to make another 10? She's like, at the end of the conversation, she's saying, now nah, we just want to get rid of it. If we were to sell it in its current condition, that's probably what we'd end up doing. Okay, so it'll be 50 to 60,000. That's going to be a great investment for somebody. So anyway, just understanding their why. And then the next part of this is just that pre-listing questionnaire. Put this on yellow paper for yellow for seller. Has anybody done that yet, by the way? So you can find your paper, your, your incoming sheets. This is ready for you guys to download. So I think that was pretty much the, the main content for today. There's a listing presentation on command. Like I said, I don't want to get into a command class. That would be a whole hour, two hour session on its own. But there's entire listing presentations and everything in command. So when you're working on your business, go into command and click around that on time. Just see what's in there. Put yourself on the plans, go through the presentation, pull it, print it off and just take it with you and read through it when you're sitting in a doctor's office or wherever you're on hold or waiting for somebody at a listing appointment like yesterday. So anyway, that's, that's our stuff on the sellers. Did you guys get some good stuff today? All yes. right. I, I mean, yeah, here's sure. the thing. We're really not skipping around and skipping stuff out. We're going through it in an hour, but I, I mean, is it good stuff? You guys getting good yeah. things you can use? Yeah. Awesome. I mean, because it is you guys. This is your time. You're the one investing the time. I'm just trying to share the information that'll help you the best. So thank you guys for showing up. Hey, go post on social media somewhere around there, all the other agents that aren't here and let them know what you're getting out of it or how awesome it is or whatever, okay? Thank Thanks, you. Brad. Thanks, Brad. Have a good week, everyone.